Hey, welcome to Big Me Kickoff. I'm your host, Kevin Noon. It is Friday, December 3rd, Championship Weekend. And unfortunately, as we know, the Buckeyes will not be playing this weekend. We will get into championship games here in a minute here on the Big Me Kickoff. I want to start off by saying for all of you watching us on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, give us a thumbs up, all that good stuff. It helps with the algorithm. It helps pay the bills around here, so please do that. If you're listening to us audio only through Spreaker, Apple iTunes, any of those good sources, be sure to subscribe to the channel or whatever through the platform. It all helps out. Now that we got that housekeeping out of the way, let's kind of get to where we stand now. And we've gone through the postmortem already about the game. I don't need to talk about it really anymore. Um, we've now moved on. Ohio State is waiting for its bowl opponent and its bowl destination. It really seems like it's going to be the Rose Bowl. We've talked about that, talked about that on an earlier show where, uh, Mark Givler joined me earlier in the week as the college football playoff rankings were released. So, um, now what? It's also award season. And on Thursday, some news came out. CJ Stroud Winner of the Big Ten Offensive Player of the Year. Winner of the Quarterback of the Year in the Conference. Winner of the Freshman of the Year in the in the Conference. Was left off of the Walter Camp Player of the Year Award finalists. He had made the semifinalist lists. Did not make the finalists. Final five. Kenneth Walker, running back at Michigan State, did make the list. Kenneth Walker is an offensive player in the Big Ten. C.J. Stroud is an offensive player in the Big Ten. You see where I'm kind of going here? Stroud did not get the nod. Uh, Walker did. It doesn't really mean anything. We're going to find out about Heisman here soon enough. You know, if you're pulling for Stroud's chances, you want to have Aiden Hutchinson kind of disappear in the championship game of the Big Ten. You want Bryce... uh, um, Wow, I'm just I'm just spacing on it. Bryce Young, God bless. I'm just spacing today. Uh, you want him to kind of go anonymous in the uh, SEC championship game. Unfortunately, uh, CJ Stroud does not have a game to play this week, and the last impression is going to be him walking off the field at Michigan Stadium on the wrong end of a decision. I don't think he's going to win the Heisman, but I think he is going to New York. And if he goes to New York, my plan is to go to New York because this will be a good dry run for him because I think next year it's going to be hard to keep him away from that award. Uh, You know, he's not going to have the same talent around him in certain positions, but new guys step up, new guys step into these roles. You know, Chris Olave leaves, Garrett Wilson leaves, other guys will get into those roles. Uh, The Big Ten announced its all-conference team uh, earlier this week. It started with the defense. Wasn't a lot for Ohio State there, to be honest. And then went to the offense. And obviously, C.J. Stroud, front and center, winning those awards. First player ever to win, to have that clean sweep of quarterback, freshman, and offensive player of the year. I mean, again, it just goes to show the kind of year that he had, the kind of talent he is, the kind of talent that the Ohio State offense was. Hard to believe this team went 10-2, and but it happens. Um, I'm not going to put boards up here just because we're going to kind of burn through this pretty quick. Your first team offense, CJ Stroud at quarterback, media and coaches had him on the first team, uh, offensive lineman Thayer Munford and Nick petit Friere, both the media and coaches had him on first team. And then wide receiver Chris Olave made first team with the coaches, did not make it with the media. We'll get to second team here in a second. On the first team defense, only Haskell Garrett made first team defense and he was named by both coaches and media uh second team offense trevion henderson named by both garrett wilson named by both and then we get into some one either ors chris olave uh, second team by the media paris johnson second team by the coaches dewan jones second team by the media keeping up with me here uh second team defense uh, nobody was unanimous in terms of coaches and media. Tyreek Smith was named by the coaches. Zach Harrison was named by the media. Ronnie Hickman was named by the coaches. And then on special teams, Noah Ruggles was named special teams kicker uh, by both. Third team offense, Jackson Smith and Jigba by both. Dewan Jones by the coaches. 
Paris Johnson by the media. So kind of flip-flopping from second team. And then your third team defense, Zach Harrison by the coaches, Denzel Burke by the coaches, Tyreek Smith by the media, Ronnie Hickman by the media. So what are the biggest surprises to you out there? I mean, I'm really kind of surprised about Olave, but the funny thing is, is that Olave and Wilson both believe that Jackson Smith and Jigba is the best receiver on the team. The stats this year would say that Jackson Smith and Jigba was the most productive receiver on the team, and he ends up being third team. Olave ends up being first team and second team, you know, one and one, and then and Wilson is uh, second team by both. I mean, obviously in a conference where you have David Bell, where you have Jahan Dotson, it's going to be difficult. And, you know, I can make an argument that one or both of the Ohio State receivers are better than Dotson. Uh, David Bell had a pretty remarkable season, but, you know, the argument's going to be made again, again, sort of like the C.J. Stroud has just too much talent around him. The numbers got diluted a little bit with what Ohio State had, whereas Penn State had Jahan Dotson. Purdue had David Bell. So when you have guys like that who get just a lion's share of the attention, there's no, there's no split going on. So I don't know. I think I think Denzel Burke probably got a little bit of a raw deal, only making third team, and that was third team by the coaches. And as a member of the media, it's my job to sit there and stick up for the media, but I can't stick up for the media in this case. The coaches got it right. The coaches are the ones that watch the film. I'm not saying necessarily that the coaches are sitting there. The actual head coaches are sitting there. Oh, I got to get this exactly right. I got to figure this out. You know, there's probably a staffer that fills it out, but... You know, I I tend to think that they're going to be a little bit more in the know than some members of the media. And again, this isn't this isn't me trying to stir up controversy. This isn't me taking shots at the media. But I just tend to think that the media sometimes gets a little caught up in the name of the player and maybe not the play of the player. Um. Ronnie Hickman, I was glad to see him make second and third team. I, I probably would have had him second team on my ballot based on what he was able to do. Um, Haskell Garrett, first team. Haskell had some moments, and Haskell disappeared at some points. I, won, I was probably a little surprised there. It wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have surprised me to see him slide to the second team, to be quite honest. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. You know, again, talking about... The, you know, all Big Ten team, it's all well and good. It's something that's going to be written about in the media guide. It's a nice little note. I guarantee you next season I'll write about it going into the season. So-and-so was first team all Big Ten. But it doesn't change a whole lot at the end of the day. It doesn't really, it certainly doesn't change any fortunes in terms of what this means for the team moving forward. But it's a good, you know, you want to be you want to be celebrated for your accomplishments, and the players are being celebrated for those accomplishments. And I still, I still have to laugh a little bit about Stroud just sweeping those awards because even coming out of the Michigan game, there were people saying that Stroud wasn't the right answer and that it's time to just move on. And I understand people were pissed. People were pissed off about the outcome. Been forever and a day since Ohio State lost that team up north. People forgot what it was like. And they were going to throw anybody, anyone, anywhere, anytime under the proverbial bus. But, you know, I'm not going to come out and say that C.J. Stroud had a fantastic game against Michigan. They didn't have a terrible game. He certainly missed a couple throws. He, But he had receivers that dropped balls, too. So... While C.J. Stroud was far from perfect, C.J. Stroud was far from a top five problem that the, the Buckeyes faced in that situation. Um, going through some other news quickly before we get to talking about the championship games that start tonight with a pair of games and then a lot of action on Saturday. Uh, Marcus Freeman, you know, by the time you know, from the time that I'm recording this, he had not been officially named Notre Dame's head coach. That may change in the time that this is sitting. Uh, on the shelf waiting to run on Friday morning. So that's big news. So that takes off a name of a potential coach that could maybe come to Ohio State. But I'm going to be quite honest, he had his choice of head coaching jobs out there. There were going to be multiple offers out there. And if Luke Fickle would have gotten the uh, Notre Dame job, 
don't you think Marcus Freeman would have been offered the Cincinnati job? Uh, I think he would have taken a Cincinnati head coaching job over an Ohio State D.C. job. Uh, Brian Kelly moving to LSU. He had an offer on the table to Marcus for Marcus Freeman for him to follow him down there. Highest paid coordinator in college football. A little telling that nobody is following Brian Kelly down to Baton Rouge. And that's not an LSU thing. That's a Brian Kelly thing. Everybody is going to rally around this new unnamed head coach who's going to be Marcus Freeman. Uh, Steve Adazio is out of Colorado State. That was announced on Thursday. Look for Tony Alford to be on the short, short, short list for that job, which, of course, would create a vacancy if he takes it. We're not speculating, but if he takes it, that creates a vacancy. You have to wonder what that means for somebody like Richard Young, or for Richard Young, the running back out of Lehigh Acres, Florida, who has such a great relationship with Alford. I think Ohio State certainly can go out and find somebody who is you know, of, of similar character to Tony Alford, but Alford just recruits the state of Florida so well. Uh, you got to wonder what that means. A lot of a lot of changes could be in the offing, but you know we're not going to get too far into that. There, there are later shows to talk about that. We will get into that in another show. Uh, we're about eleven minutes in. Let's get to the upcoming games. Friday night games tonight. We have the Conference USA game between Western Kentucky and UTSA, and the Pac-12 game between Oregon and Utah. So let me go to my handy dandy notes. I never, I never prepare prior to these shows, but I did here. Western Kentucky minus three in this game, 7 p.m. CBS Sportsnet. Uh, Western Kentucky's quarterback has just put up like crazy Nintendo numbers, 4,968 yards, 52 touchdowns. Far and away the number one passing offense in the nation. Ohio State was not far behind. Western Kentucky cannot run the ball. Is it they cannot or because they just won't or they don't need to? They are only rushing for 99.8 yards a game. UTSA is allowing about 22 points a game. Really proved through the course of the year that Illinois, the win against the Illini was not a fluke. You look at that and it's like, ugh, Brad Bielema can't get it done. Finding out is a lot more difficult than when he was at uh, Wisconsin, right? Well, UTSA proved to be a pretty good team. Illinois proved not to be a good team. The thing I've noticed here UTSA is averaging 37 points a game. Western Kentucky is averaging 43 points a game. So that means 80 points combined. And I, I didn't screw around with the decimals. I didn't screw around with the decimals to figure it out. UTSA has been pushed in a couple of games. Western Kentucky, you know, they put up a ton of points. I mean, again, Western is a three-point favorite in this one. I like Western to cover. Uh, let's go to the Pac-12 game, 8 p.m. ABC. Utah, two-and-a-half-point favorite. Uh, the Utes defeated Oregon 38-7 in late November at Utah, at uh, Rice-Eccles. This game's in Vegas. Um, here's an interesting factoid I found here. The South, the Pac-12 South, has won this game once. It's 9-1 advantage to the North, which means that Oregon, just based on that, seems to have a little bit of an edge in terms of kind of like the Big Ten, that the Big Ten East has won them all. Since the Big Ten got away from uh, leaders and legends, the East wins them all. Well, the North almost wins them all. Utah's 0-2 in this game. Oregon's 4-0 all time in this game. With all of that being said, I'm taking Utah. Utah just looked really good last time that these two teams faced one another. Uh, you sit there, you just see, I, I think that Utah feels more motivation. I mean, and that's always a thing, especially when you get to bowl games. And we're not, these aren't bowl games. These are championship games. But you need to measure the, uh, what the team's playing for, what they're excited about. You, uh, Oregon, even being at 10, knows it's not getting into the college football playoff. Sure, it's playing for the Rose Bowl. And that means something. That means a lot. I mean, to a Big 10 or Pac-12 team, it means a lot. But... Is this Oregon team really as dialed in as it was? I mean, they had so many near misses along the way, and then Utah just goes in and just just gets whooped, gets whooped by by the Utes. So I'm going to take Utah. If you're an Ohio State fan, which I assume you are watching the show, I would take Utah in this one as well. And here's why. I think that Ohio State's path to the playoff is like a one-outer with like a double deck. I mean, seriously, it's like 1-2% chance of perfect chaos happening 
it certainly would have helped Ohio State if Notre Dame were completely rudderless in terms of if Notre Dame were rudderless in having a head coach. So Ohio State could leapfrog Notre Dame and then some things could fall there. I'm not going to say not to watch the announcement show on Sunday, but the odds are very long. We've done some shows on this. Tony Gerdeman wrote a great piece about what needs to happen. Again, it's about a one-outer in a deck of 104 cards, so probably not going to happen. But if you if you love chaos, pull for Utah. Uh, let's get to the first round of the Saturday games. we got Big 12, MAC, and Mountain West on this page. Uh, Baylor versus Oklahoma State, number nine, number five. Oak State is a five-and-a-half point favorite in this one. Oak State won an early October meeting, 24-14 in Stillwater. Baylor's been pushed in some games here recently. Their last three wins have all been by 14 points or less. Oklahoma State is a suddenly hot team. They're just, you know, they've got a solid defense. The offense does enough. And they don't have necessarily the offensive players that maybe that they've had in past years. But I think that the defense is strong enough along with the offense that they have to be able to give Baylor a lot of issues. But Baylor, on the other hand, is a team that seems to thrive when it's kind of looked over. And now let's not get back into 2014 when Baylor and TCU were both above, above Ohio State. And Ohio State's 59 nothing win jump, uh, was able to jump over them. I'm going to take Oklahoma State in this one, but I'm going to say pull for Baylor. And here's why. Baylor's at nine. Even being a conference champion, even beating number five, I don't know if enough is going to be thought of Baylor to where Baylor can leapfrog Ohio State ultimately if it comes down to a beauty competition. Now, if it if it doesn't matter, if, if it doesn't really matter, then they could sit there and move Baylor ahead of Ohio State if Baylor wins because it's not going to change the outcome of anything. But if that fourth spot is wide open, you could sit there and put Baylor in, which might turn on 14 televisions in Waco, or you could put Ohio State in. And again, I know we're playing the whole game of this is such a long shot, Kevin. Why are you even doing this? Just trying to get us all worked up. No, 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 no. But if you want the chaos to happen, pull for Baylor. Uh, Mac is another noon game. Kent State, Northern Illinois. Kent State's a three and a half point favorite. Kent State head coach Sean Lewis is such a solid coach. We don't talk about him a lot because there's just not a lot of overlap for us to talk about him, but will somebody just snap him up for another job already? And I know that there are a lot of people that listen that are, you know, have a favorite Mac team and they're probably Kent State fans saying, shut up, shut up, we want to keep him. Well, you're not going to be able to. When somebody really is ready to make a move, I think Sean Lewis is going to be a tremendous hire. I want to see what he can do recruiting on a on a big scale, uh, but recruiting to Kent State is no picnic in the park. You know, you certainly have some schools in the MAC that don't have the facilities, don't have the support that you would have at a lot of other places, even in other group of five situations. So what he has done there has been remarkable. Uh, the Mac West has won seven of the last ten, which means Northern Illinois, who's in the Mac West, is on the right end of that. I did get to cover a Mac championship game in 2012. Strangely enough, it was Kent State in Northern Illinois. Kent State came up on the wrong end of that one, 44-37 in two overtimes. Tremendous game. Uh, unfortunately, Kent State came up a little short. I think Kent State's going to come up a little short in this one to take Northern Illinois to pull the upset. Uh, on the final uh, game on this page, Utah State versus number 19, San Diego State, 3 p.m. on Fox. San Diego State's a six-point favorite. I really don't have much here. I really don't care about this game all that much. I'm going to just take San Diego State. Vegas knows something, so there you go. Uh, let's go to the next page. Sunbelt, SEC, and American. Uh, Sunbelt, you got App State versus Louisiana, 3.30 on ESPN. App State is a three-point favorite despite Louisiana being ranked. Louisiana beat App State 41-13 this season. Why is App State favored in this game? I'm not really sure. I've watched USL play a little bit, and I, I know I call I still call Louisiana USL. I know Billy Napier is gone. He's now the Florida head coach, so it is a team without a head coach. So maybe that's what the thought is. I think these Louisiana kids, these Raging Cajuns, have something to prove. I'm taking Louisiana to win this game. 
obviously the big game of the day regardless of what your rooting interest is, is going to be the SEC championship game between Georgia and Alabama. 4 p.m. on CBS, UGA six and a half point favorite. Bama has won the last six games it's played against Georgia, five of them being in Atlanta for the SEC championship game. The last two times they faced them in the SEC championship game, they were both one score games. There are going to be a lot of podcasts out there that are going to analyze this, college football nerds, everybody else. I'm not going to overanalyze this game because it's not it's it's not a game that I've done a lot of preparation on. At the end of the day, I think UGA is the best team in the nation, which doesn't mean I'm picking, picking them to win the whole darn thing. But I watched that Alabama-Auburn game, and Alabama had no business winning that game. Once Jamison Williams got sent out for targeting, they had nothing. They'll have Jamison Williams back because it was a first half penalty. So he served his entire penalty and he'll be there. But I just don't think that Alabama and it's really non-existent running game is going to get anything on the ground against Georgia. And I think that that Georgia will be able to keep Alabama at bay, even if Jamison Williams goes off for a buck 50 and a couple scores. I'm taking Georgia, pull for Georgia. You want that loss hung on Alabama. Try and get them out of the conversation. Then we get to the American 4 p.m. on ABC. UC minus 10 and a half. UC's won the last two, seven of the last nine in this series. Um, UC has had its moments to where it has not looked great. It's winning its games. Tulsa was not a great game. USF was not a great game, but then they came out and smacked around SMU and ECU. Are there any distractions around the Luke Fickle situation? That's something I got to wonder a little bit. Uh, Obviously, it seems as if they have dodged the bullet for Notre Dame. It doesn't change the fact that I think Luke Fickle's name still get mentioned for every major job out there, but Notre Dame really was one that I thought he could take. So how, how well do they silence the noise around them. Uh, I I sit there and I look at the defenses here in this game. UC is number eight in total defense, number three in scoring defense, 15.8 points per game. Houston's number six in total defense, number 19 in scoring defense, 19.8 points per game. So we're sitting there looking at teams that are allowing less than 20 points a game. For all this talk about defense, we'll just watch. It'll end up being an offensive game. It'll end up being something with a lot of points. I'm going to take Cincinnati to win, not to cover. I think Houston will will play them close. But again, if you are in that chaos theory, pull for Houston. Pull for Houston. If you want to see, if you want Sunday to mean something, that you know that I I think you need to see that. So we'll see. Let's go to the round, the last round of the games. We got Big Ten and ACC. Michigan and Iowa. Number two, Michigan. Number thir- thirteen, Iowa. 8 p.m. Fox. Michigan minus 11, the largest favorite in all of the championship games. Well, let's just be honest here. Iowa can't score. That's a problem. Iowa can't score on offense. I should probably change it to that. Uh, Iowa's number three in the nation in turnover margin. Iowa, if it wants to have a chance, needs to probably score about 14 points on defense and special teams. Uh, Iowa's number 14 against the run, number nine in scoring defense. So Iowa should be able to keep this relatively low scoring. Uh, Michigan, on the other hand, we know what they've been doing in the media. Popping off, talking all sorts of, you know what, about Ohio State. Do they lose focus here? They're playing for so much. There's so much in front of them. You would think that, oh, there's just no way that they can lose focus. There's no way that they could completely lose their mind. Football's a funny sport. Jim Harbaugh is a funny coach. And I don't mean funny haha. I just mean funny strange. You just don't know. You just don't know what you could you could see in in that type of situation. Kirk Ferentz has been to the fair and seen the bear. He is a wily old veteran. He's going to have some things planned. Unfortunately I don't think he's going to be able to plan much in the way of offense. That offense is just horrible, but you know, I don't know. I, you know, if I'm betting, I'm going to say straight up, I would take Michigan. I would say, I'm not sure Michigan covers, but I I just, I would stay off of that bet. And for the best possible Ohio State bowl location, I would say root against Iowa. 
I'm not going to ask anybody out there to root for Michigan. Do what you want to do. I'm, I don't have any say in this, but uh, if Iowa loses, that means that the worst that Ohio State really could do is the Rose Bowl because then Michigan would be in the playoff. Ohio State's locked in. Ohio State cannot jump over Michigan. Michigan could lose by 50. And I don't think Ohio State, due to the head-to-head, -head, could get above Michigan. So there's no benefit for Michigan losing in the playoff argument. There's plenty to talk about if Michigan loses just for the, well, congratulations. You may have won the game, but you lost the war. But I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll see. And then the last one, we got Pittsburgh and Wake Forest, 8 p.m. on ABC. Pitt minus three and over under of 71 and a half upon recording this. Pitt's got the number four total offense and number four scoring offense. Wake's got the number nine total offense and number three scoring offense. So two of the top five scoring offenses here. Here's the difference. Pitt's number 42 in total defense. Wake is number 100. And that isn't a yardage game. Don't get trapped into that. But Wake has shown no ability to play defense. I think Pittsburgh can play enough defense. I'm going to take Pitt in this one. So there you have it. Those are my picks for the college uh, you know, college championships here on Friday and Saturday. And then we will find out a lot more on Sunday where the Buckeyes will go. If, if Michigan wins or if Iowa loses, Ohio State's probably going to the Rose Bowl with that one in, one in a very large number chance of chaos happening and a miracle happening and drawing Georgia, probably in South Florida. Now, if Iowa pulls off the upset, that kind of that changes some things around, and Ohio State could end up getting moved down to the Fiesta or the Peach. Uh, not you know, those are two bowls that are not contractually bound to a conference. Anybody hoping for the Sugar? Too bad that's SEC and Big Twelve, so we know that isn't going to happen. We know two of the other games are already locked into playoffs. And then the Rose has got its Big 12 or Big 10 AC or Big 10 Pac 12 alliances. So, and then the Big 10, you know, champion really kind of ends up there. So, I think Ohio State's going to the Rose. So, there you go. Um, let's wrap it up by talking a little bit about Ohio State basketball. And the Buckeyes shocked the world to a certain extent by beating Duke 71 66 then ranked number one Duke, still ranked number one because the rankings have not changed at this point. Vegas had Ohio State only as a three-point home dog. So apparently Vegas knew something. Even with that being said, Vegas was still taking Duke. I'm sure there were a lot of people who were live betting that game at the half who saw Ohio State down 13, get down by as much as 15, couldn't hit a free throw. Couldn't stop turning the ball over. It The game was on Giving Tuesday, and Ohio State was giving the ball away freely. And then things started to turn around. Zed Key, huge game. Zed Key, I think he, if they could get 85% of that from Zed Key every week, this team would be hard to beat. Uh, Cedric Russell had really not been very impactful so far up until that game. Ends up hitting a couple of big threes, like three big threes, a couple of rebounds, no turnovers. Again, talking about Giving Tuesday, no turnovers from Cedric Russell. So that was huge as well. Uh, you know, EJ Liddell didn't necessarily have his best game, but he did enough. And let's not forget, Ohio State did this without three players. Did, there was no Justice Suing, there was no Seth Towns, and there was no Eugene Brown. You know, Gene is kind of a spot player. Seth Towns, you know, can be a spot player, but Justice Suing is majorly in the plans of this team, and they haven't had him for a while as he's dealing with, dealing with an injury that should still keep him out for a couple more weeks. And Ohio State goes and knocks off Duke, and Duke played a horrible game at the, you know, in the second half. Duke never really, as I said, Duke got up 10, 12, 13, 15 points and could never deliver that knockout punch to Ohio State, and then really went ice cold in the second half. So now you have the Buckeyes who are sitting with the, the two losses, but a couple of, you know, a couple of quadrant one wins. Duke's a Q1 win. Seton Hall's a Q1 win. You know, you'd love to have the Florida game back. You'd love to have the Xavier game back. It is what it is. Ohio State will play at Penn State on Sunday. That'll be a big game just because you get that little taste of Big Ten action as the Big Ten schedule has moved to 20 games. 
So you have to just jam those games in where you can. It'll be interesting to see uh, Jamari Wheeler going home to Penn State, what kind of reception he gets. I'm not expecting a great one. Um, You know, I like Ohio State in that game. I know Penn State has really been a thorn in the side of the Buckeyes through, uh, through recent years. They got their own little part of Penn State on the roster now. So I, you know, I like, I like Ohio State. I watched, watched the Big Ten and the Big Ten ACC challenge. Big Ten wins at 8-6. The Big Ten was up 7-3. And then I just watched team after team after team kind of make a mess in their diapers. Namely, Nebraska. Four overtime, bleeding eyes type of game. Nebraska could have won it from the free throw line by hitting a pair of free throws. They missed one. Their best player, freshman player, he was shocked. I mean, Nebraska had chance after chance to end the game and just couldn't end the game. There was a tussle. There were ejections. Nebraska had three or four players foul out of the game. It, Nebraska had three or four calls go against them, too, the, the against the Huskers. Teddy Valentine was there. Teddy was as demonstrative as he ever is. Some of the calls were as questionable as they've ever been, but you know it is what it is. I, you know, I, I. It would have been the most Big Ten thing ever for them to get up seven three and not win the challenge. And yes, you have fourteen teams playing, but since the cup was in the hands of the ACC last year, the Big Ten needed to win eight to take the cup back. So it was seven six, and it all came down to the Wisconsin game, and Wisconsin was able to hang on and give the uh, the conference the win. Now, what does that mean? Nothing. It means that the Big Ten's probably a little deeper this year than the ACC. Big Ten took it on the chin from the Big East and the Gabbitt games. So, you know, we can sit there and go round and round once we get into the season. Oh, oh, who's the best conference? I think, you know, the Big Ten's going to be right there. The Big East is going to be right there. You know, it all means something in terms of what all the all the calculations are and stuff. But as you can hear, my phone is ringing, so I'm going to call this a show, and I will talk to you again here very soon on the Big Me Kickoff. I'm your host, Kevin Noon. Take care.